One of the most vivid and meaningful passages about apologetics in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 10.5, which says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. This is how the Apostle Paul summarized his apostolic ministry, and this is exactly what we're going to try to do a little of today. For those of us who hold to Orthodox Christology, worshiping Jesus as very God of very God, the prologue of John's Gospel, the first 18 verses, offers one of the most rich and robust passages evidencing the full deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Quite ironically, however, Linguistic and conceptual complexities in John's prologue also make it one of the chief sources of heterodox and even heretical views, surprisingly. This was true of many of the Alexandrian thinkers of the 2nd century and the 3rd century AD. They were so far from, removed from the Hebraic theism and so steeped in the pantheistic Neoplatonism that they naturally were inclined to contextualize God, uh, John's prologue to fit their presuppositions. Two of the main examples of this would be Origen of Alexandria from the second century. He was a former student of Plotinus, uh, a well-known you know, father of Neoplatonism, and also Bishop Arius of the third century, who was the fount of the Arian heresy. They both reinterpreted the prologue of John's gospel to support the position that Jesus was on a lower level than God, a lower level of being than God. So, you know, like divine, but somehow not quite fully divine, or, you know, something along those lines. The problem is not just an ancient one, however. Neoplatonism is alive and well today under different names, and its apologists may lead people to heterodox and heretical views of both God and of Jesus, with the help of their interpretations of John's prologue. Particularly vulnerable to this drift away from orthodoxy are the thoughtful lay people who read their English translations of John, or the book of Hebrews, or the book of Colossians, similar challenges in all three, and they sincerely try to understand poorly translated or otherwise complex, controversial passages about Jesus without any allegiance to the ancient Orthodox creeds, or without the benefit of recent Orthodox biblical scholarship. Okay, as this talk is very worldview-heavy, it may be good for you to know what I mean by various worldviews. As seen in the uh, infographic here, uh, atheism, at the far left, atheism only believes in the world, symbolized by a W, so, which stands for, you know, not just our planet, but the universe, space-time continuum, you know, space-time energy, not just material stuff. Uh, shifting a little bit to the right, pantheism, like atheism, only sees the world, the universe, but it likes to call it, it likes to use uh, God talk and call it God. Um, it was, there may be some argument about this, but uh, some may say that the only difference between atheism and pantheism is just that the atheist may be avoiding God talk and the pantheist may be uh, embracing it. Shifting a little further to the right, panentheists, uh, which is uh, Greek for um, all in God and God in all. Uh, panentheists hold that uh, while God and the world are actually separate things, the lines between them are very permeable, somewhat blurry, such that God is very imminent in the world, and the world may also intrude into God. Shifting further to theism, God and the world are totally separate from one another. Total separation. Uh, the creator is... Uh, they're not to be confused. Don't, uh, uh, the creator is separate from and transcendent to his creation. But God is nonetheless fully aware of what's going on in the world, omniscience. And he may interact with the world, you know, providence, miracles, etc. And then he may even enter into the world in some mysterious way, such as the Shekinah glory, a theophany, Christophany, incarnation, uh, whenever he pleases. Uh, at the far right, we have deism, which also sees the creator and the creation as totally distinct from each other. But it holds that, uh, that this God will not, either cannot or will not interact with the world. Now, theism is the view presented in the Bible and held by the authors of the Bible. Neoplatonism and the other forms of ancient Greek philosophy tend to operate in and be the fountain of both 
uh, pantheism and panentheism, which uh, used to go by the same term, incidentally. They, uh, for, for a long time, there, there wasn't a thing called panentheism. It was just lumped in with pantheism, so just to make things more confusing. Uh, for perspective, let's see. So for perspective, when the Apostle Paul was speaking to Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Athens, as recorded in Acts 17, Paul was the apologist for classical theism. And uh, in my judgment, the uh, the Stoics would typically flow between, you know, kind of inconsistently, you never know. They could flow between pan pantheism and panentheism. They're kind of boxed together. They could be anywhere in there. And then the, uh, the Epicureans would go from anywhere from atheism to pantheism, but they, they would start to be out of their comfort zone if you started to say that God is outside the universe. So I, I kind of leave them here. So, uh, yeah, that's Acts chapter 17, ancient history. And uh, in many ways, we're, uh, you know, kind of in the same boat. We're starting kind of the, on Mars Hill today, uh, as Paul was there in Athens. Uh, Paul quoted the Stoic poets to find some common ground, to reach them where they were at, and to bring them towards theism. Now, Stoicism was influenced by Platonism and would, in turn, influence Neoplatonism. In the 3rd century, Neoplatonism would produce some of the fiercest critics of Christianity, such as Porphyry, who had also been a student of Plotinus. And some of the also produced some of the most subtle semi-Christian, such as Origen, and pseudo-Christian, such as Arius, uh, competitors to Christianity. Uh, now that we're on the same page with worldviews, I want to make sure that you feel the problem of interpreting John's prologue before we set about trying to defend the Orthodox interpretation. In feeling the problem, I may take you out of your comfort zone. Right. In his prologue to his gospel, the Apostle John introduces us uh, to Jesus with three terms, the logos, or the word, the light, or phos, and also a son who is begotten. Okay, so the word, the light, and a begotten son. All three of these analogs may incline the, incline the interpreter towards either sub-orthodox or heterodox or heretical views about Jesus. They may also inspire a slide away from theism towards pantheism. When attempting to make sense of John's enigmatic phrase, uh, logos, for example, the interpreter might quite naturally superimpose upon it uh, his own connotations of what those words mean to him. Or he might uh, superimpose upon it a meaning from earlier pagan usages of the same term. Such a logos could serve as a cornerstone for an emanational pantheistic God world model, a model where the line between creator and creation blurs and where the Logos becomes an emanation of God. Making matters worse, John identifies Jesus as the true light, and that may naturally uh, lend additional support to pantheist, oh, sorry for the typos, additional support for pantheistic interpretations of both God and Jesus. Now, we tend today, you know, thinking in more scientific terms, we think of light as as waves and particles, as photons, as quanta, that are created by the inner workings of our yellow sun and that are uh, emitted out from, uh, or you could say emanating out from the sun to our planet. Now, with this type of thinking, we might reason that if Jesus is to God, like sunlight is to the sun, then perhaps, forgive me for saying it out loud, Jesus is a generated mission of God that has beginning, that it travels, it illuminates, it absorbs. It's, sorry, it is absorbed, and it's uh, transformed into thermal energy. So something that has a beginning sort of has an ending, uh, and that, that puts us into an uncomfortable place if we think analogically like that. Uh, for there is a big difference between the, the sun as a whole and the, uh, the light it gives out. John's third analogy for Jesus, that of a son who is generated by his father, may give additional force to Neoplatonic interpretations of both Logos and Theos. When a father begets, quote-unquote, a son, well, while that son is in some ways an extension of the father's substance, it still remains a new created thing that is not exactly identical to the older thing, to the parent. And it's causally contingent upon it. That also puts us into an uncomfortable position. 
So in this paper, we'll focus our attention to the problem of interpreting just logos, the word. We're going to leave the related problems of light and begetting for others to solve. I, I include uh, endnotes there to, to give some good hints on where to go with it. All right, talking just a little bit about words. So there's a problem in just superimposing our own English connotations and our own preconceptions. So we English speakers are quite unfortunately well positioned to misunderstand John's prologue. We may have pre uh, preconceptions that may not fit with his concepts, and our English translations may not be adequate vehicles for John's meaning. Almost every English translation of John's gospel translates logos as the word. But for English speakers here in the 21st century, words tend to be very cheap things. Most of the words that are said around us perhaps don't even need to be said or heard. Uh, a single word by itself may have so many potential meanings that it may, remains uh, essentially meaningless in isolation. Also, words tend to be very transient. Uh, at first, they only exist potentially as symbols in a given community that, uh, sorry, that a given community can use to encode and decode as concepts. <clears throat> the word then flashes briefly into the mind of the inv individual, is spoken into the air, may or may not find home in another person's mind, and then it may just be gone. Maybe it echoes in their mind, maybe they forget it, but it's gone. And that's, uh, that puts us into a, a difficult and confusing place if we uh, reason analogically about Jesus as the word in that way. Uh, we would, for example, much rather have the voicemail that contains our words deleted than to be deleted ourselves. We would rather have the letter that we just mailed to be burned than for ourselves to be burned. There is a real difference. While thinking that God relates to Jesus just like a speaker somehow relates to a single spoken word, or perhaps multiple words, we are, at the outset, rather underwhelmed. We also may be poised to understand John's God, uh, Theos or Theon, and John's Word of God, Logos, in a Neoplatonic perspective. I'm just saying there's a danger here. John introduces Jesus Christ to his readers first and foremost as the Logos, a being that is somehow simultaneously distinct from God in one way, and yet the same thing as God in some other way. That's very clear from the text. Christians in the orthodox formulations of Christianity explain this distinct and same mystery by clarifying that God the Father and Jesus, the Logos, are different persons who share the same essence or, or nature. In other words, there are three who's that share one what. Not saying that answers all questions. It's just a helpful way to think about it. This disarms the predictable accusations of polytheism or bitheism or tritheism and the, also the embrace of logical contradictions about a triune God. There is no contradiction. If you say there's one in one way, three in a different way, there is no logical contradiction. But what if John, writing in Greek as he did, was integrating some Greek notions about God, pagan Greek notions? John did not invent the term logos. It was used as an important technical term among many pagan Greek philosophers and, and even Jewish contextualizers who sort of straddled the realm between the Greek world, the Hellenistic world, and the Hebraic world, like Philo, for example. Yeah, what if John, much like Philo, the Alexandrian Jew before him, was synthesizing Hebraic and Hellenistic concepts together into a hybrid model of the relationships between God the God, the Logos, and the Cosmos. What if? If John wrote his gospel as a Neoplatonic type of sort of pseudo-Trinitarian philosopher, perhaps he was trying to say that the divinity or the deity, that the theos, the substance of God, was the first and ultimate substance of reality, and then at some point before the world came into existence, the God, Pantheon, emanated from Theos as the first emanation. We're getting into heresy here, I know that. I'm trying to make you feel, feel the problem and feel a little uncomfortable. Next, the Logos emanated out of the God. So here you can kind of see it. Theos is divinity or deity. And then Theon is God, like the God. 
and then D Lagos, and then here's the cosmos, the universe, uh, what, what the Bible calls the world. John attempts to explain the emanation in three ways. The Lagos emanated like a word or a statement, is the expression of the thought in a man's mind, and of the air from his lungs or mouth. Number two, uh, sorry, there's a little repetition here. Like a golden sunlight radiates out from the yellow sun, or like a sun emerges from the loins or bosom, depending on your translation, uh, of the father that begets him. This second emanation of deity began in this hypothetical model. I'm not recommending it. To exist in parallel with, that's uh, the first emanation of deity for a time. Both emanations remain divine, quote-unquote, because ultimately all is theos. Everything is God in this model. As part of the creative process, the Logos gave form, design, order, governance, energy, and sustenance to the cosmos. The Logos also deposited a seed of Logos inside of us humans so that we could reason, speak, recognize the Logos, and do other similar things that plants and animals cannot do. Sometime later, the Logos entered into the cosmos as part of the cosmos and became one of us. He did so that we humans could become extensions of God like he is, enjoying more participation, interaction, and mystical connection with the second emanation. Again, I'm not recommending this view. I'm just still laying out the problem. All right, so uh, conceptually here, all right, so uh, theism, where the creation is distinct from the creator. You might think in terms, uh, here's a, an analogy. The, the painter is distinct from his or her painting. Uh, in some way, you can say that the painter is in the painting, but with the severe caveats and limitations. Um, yes, you can recognize the handiwork. You can see the thumbprints, the fingerprints, the, the artistic style. Uh, or in a similar way, the computer programmer is different than the program that the programmer creates. Uh, now, the program, programmer can also enter into that program at will. Uh, it's not just a closed system that he's closed out of. Also, the, the gardener who sustains the garden, it shouldn't be confused with the garden. So that's what we're saying for theism. And, uh, of course, here's uh, King Solomon. We de dedicate to the temple just to kind of prove that this is an Old Testament view as well. Uh, in his prayer, he says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple, the temple in Jerusalem, uh, which I have built. So that, that indicates God is transcendent to the world, you know, bigger than our universe, uh, beyond our universe, in fact. All right, I don't want to get too bogged down in this, but this is kind of a sense of Neoplatonism. You know, when I was talking about, uh, you know, Bubbles kind of bubbling out of, emanating from other bubbles. Uh, he starts with the one, and then from that, there's an emanation to the noose, an emanation to the world soul, which he sort of gets from Plato, and an emanation to the sensory world. Not recommending that, of course. Uh, and then, you know, when the lines blur, we, we get into, you know, th this is a very common concept, uh, you know, God or goddess, either way. Uh, the lines blur between our world and and God. So that that would be um, that would be more along the lines of this might be a good image of uh, panentheism, where the lines blur, but you can sort of see that they're distinct. All right, I'm going to skip this next section. Go on to uh, additional catalysts for drift on page six. John's prologue is a slope that is naturally slippery in three related ways. Its ambiguities, especially in combination with ambiguities and other important Christological passages, can cause readers to begin to drift from orthodoxy to heresy. Today, English readers of John's Gospel are not likely to have his or her pre-understandings conditioned by an upbringing in a traditional Orthodox Christian cultural context. Times have changed. The English-speaking communities have changed. They are, as of the beginning of the 21st century, mixtures of Christian, post-Christian, non-Christian, or even pseudo-Christian. Uh, he is just as likely, or perhaps even more likely now, to be preconditioned by Platonic, Neoplatonic, Gnostic, or New Age pre-understandings. Those understandings will be brought to the interpretive table when he's reading John's Gospel. There are many scholarly sounding voices in the world who hold Neoplatonic or even Neo-Gnostic, which I, I'm going to kind of lump the two together. They're not exactly the same, but for, from a far distance, they sort of fit in this, my same bucket. Uh, 
views of Logos and Theos and teach in ways that would accelerate this drift. As with most passages in the Holy Scriptures, it can be said of the verses in John's prologue that there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Of course, I'm quoting Peter there. And his, his reference to Paul, I think the same thing could be applied to John without any stretch of the imagination. So a Neoplatonic theologian, uh, uh, I would consider pseudo-Christian, Francis Young, he sees John's Logos as, quote, a, a quasi-divine mediating link in the chain of being. Remember the... Yes, exactly. In the chain of being, forming a triad or trinity, not unlike that of the Neoplatonists. Yeah, so it was, and he, he is thought of as a, as a Christian. So uh, voices like that are out there. To Young, John's Logos, borrowing most immediately from Philo's Logos, was ultimately still borrowing meaning from the Stoic and the Neoplatonic sources, retaining the kernel of meaning of those pagan sources while being imbued with additional layers of meaning. And it lent itself well to Christian Doceticism and Christian Gnosticism, which I won't discuss here. Uh, similarly, John Hick, former professor of religion and theology at many different universities, he encourages us to see John's terms of logos and son, both of them, as being hyperbole and mythological expressions that the mature will not take literally. But we can still enjoy them in some non-literal sense and find them significant in our personal mystical experiences of, quote, the ultimate transcendent reality, which is the source and ground of everything, in our, quote, response to the mystery of the universe. Powered, sorry, it's, just, it's funny to me. <laughs> Powered by religious experience and guided by rational thought. All right, so you know, some good 25-cent words, but uh, what is he saying? Uh, a similar view of Logos may be found in the Gnostic Gospels. Uh, again, I'm focused more on the Neoplatonic side. I think that's the greater competitor than the Gnostic side. Eileen Pagels would be a good uh, modern Neo-Gnostic. All right, precursors to John's Logos. John did not coin the term Logos. That coin was minted, melted, and reminted many times before John wrote. It was used as an important and technical term by many ancient Greek philosophers, each one adding and subtracting some meaning. While we may focus on John as the mind writing his gospel, we must also keep in mind that the Holy Spirit mysteriously inspired the writings of John's gospel through John without overriding his personality. And that this uh, divine inspiration trickles down not just to the mind of John, but into every jot and tittle of the most minute characters of the, uh, the letters of the alphabet in the text. Whatever logos means, it was assuredly a very strategic word for the Greek, sorry, for the minds of the Greeks, for the Hellenized Jews, and the Hebraic Jews in the first century. By examining usages of logos from earlier Hellenic Hebraic and Hellenic Hebrew hybrid sources, perhaps we can determine which usage best fits John's usage of logos. A concomitant concern will be determining which God word, world model or worldview John's logos best supports. There may be a tendency for some to focus on the Greek traditions. This is natural because John's gospel was written, of course, in Koine Greek. And Koine Greek is based largely on the more ancient Attic Greek. Koine just meaning common. It's the common trade language. Now, if you consult the 10-page entry on Logos in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, that might seem like a very logical place to start. Uh, research, like if you, you know, you're the student, you want to figure out what the logos is, you might, you might consult this. And uh, this, this may be of great value. However, uh, there is a, a philosophy based on Heidegger uh, and Boltmann that underlies the methodology which that lexicon was uh, using to, to be produced. So, using it might pose a danger of subtly inclining the researcher to slide away from John's theistic usage of Logos towards a pre-Socratic, uh, and therefore, you know, atheist uh, to uh, pantheistic connotations. There's a danger there, there's, you know, no, no guarantees, but uh, it's something to be aware of. Uh, there's a 37-page entry on Logos. <laughs> Imagine that, I feel we're just scratching the surface here. 
37 page in the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology, that might be a better resource for decreasing the exposure to the Heideggerian bias. I just wanted to mention that because the tools we use to do our scholarly research, they're not neutral in their philosophy of language. And, they're, and they, they're not, uh, they also may not be uh, neutral in their metaphysic or their ontology either. Um, and they may incline some researchers to drift in the direction of Neoplatonism. But John's Logos is not simply all Greek to me. It also, it's also well known, albeit less well known, that the Hebraic or Hebrew traditions also imbued their word for word, uh, which in Hebrew is dabar or davar. Uh, and then in Aramaic, it's memra. Uh, same thing. Uh, they, their word for word was also imbued with profound meanings and deep metaphysical, transferring to physical implications. Quite naturally, when Dabar or Memra was later translated into Greek and the Septuagint, in a time and place where Hebrew and Hellenic streams were starting to mingle, Dabar would be translated as Logos. No surprise. A few influential Jewish thinkers blended Hebrew and Hellenic notions of Logos before John wrote. And a few early and noteworthy Greek Christians, uh, thinkers, interpreted Logos in a Hebraic slash Hellenistic hybrid style, not long after John wrote. We can explore ancient Greek, Hellenistic, Hebrew, and hybrid usages in the attempt to see who is John borrowing from. It would be nice to know. So that's part of what I want to investigate, and the rest of the paper will get into that. Um, Leon Morris, who is a Johannine scholar, not a Neoplatonist, a firm theist, uh, he suggested this. It's not proven beyond doubt whether the term logos, as John uses it, is to be derived from Jewish or Greek, or some other source, nor is it plain precisely what he meant by it. John does not tell us, and we are left to work out for ourselves the precise illusion and its significance. His combination of simplicity and profundity often leaves us wondering whether we have caught all of his meaning. All right, got a couple more minutes, and then I'm going to skip to the conclusion. All right, uh, Greek logoi. Logoi is the plural of logos. The logoi of the pre-Socratic philosopher. Although for some it would mean much more, among the pre-Socratic philosophers of Greece, logos generally meant something along the lines of account or word, the thing said, an argument, a discourse, a lecture, a teaching, some kind of statement. Now in this paper that I'm presenting here now, uh, I'm presenting an orderly logical account. I'm presenting a logos about the subject of the logos. This meaning may be in harmony with John, who explicitly stated that the Logos, quote, made him, God, made God known to those of us who cannot see God. That's in John chapter 118. John, as the Logos of God, does, in a sense, provide a logical account of, a discourse of, a statement, powerful statement about God, a living statement. And this may also well harmonize with John in his epistle, not his gospel, but his epistle, which says, we know also that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him, God, who is true life. Now this may be a decent start, but it's not a perfect fit, and surely does not exhaust John's meaning. Heraclitus, from the 5th century BC, appears to be the first writer to use logos as a technical term for a philosophical concept. In saying, quote, Having hearkened not to me, but to the Logos, it is wise to agree that all things are one, end quote. Heraclitus seems to, have, to be considering the Logos to be some kind of timeless, eternal, independent, absolute, and recognizable truth claim about ultimate reality. Uh, to him, the Logos is a message, an account, source of deeper knowledge. It's, uh, quote, an objective law-like principle. It governs the co cosmos, which is... Uh, which it is possible but difficult for humans to come to understand. Whereas the natural inclination of the natural man is to assume that the natural world is made up of several things, if he can comprehend the message about reality more deeply, he will see that reality is ultimately one, which brings us back to, of course, pantheism. For Heraclitus, then, it seems like the Logos was a deeper revelation to the human minds about reality and somehow sent by reality. 
those who could comprehend the Logos better would understand reality better with their minds. Uh, still talking about Heraclitus. His Logos is not to be confused with the will or the action of Zeus and the other gods of the polytheistic Greek pantheon. It's more fundamental than the gods. It's uh, a single order that directs all things. It's divine, unchanging. It's a single ordered system that also steers and controls the whole cosmos, but from within the cosmos, presumably. It explains the appearance of change as ultimately changeless, a permanent, a rational order, an intelligent system, an intelligent plan at work, the cosmos working itself out in the accordance with rational principles. In other words, at least starting to go in the direction of what we might today call intelligent design. Maybe starting to go in the direction of what uh, maybe some uh, ancient Chinese would call the Tao. Um, there's some similarities there, and this may also be uh, the type of thinking that Paul refers to in uh, Romans chapter 1, where he says that there are things, like when you look out into the universe, into nature, there are things you will come to, uh, you know, using your reason, you will understand some things about God. Of course, he also says that we're going to probably suppress those truths about God. Uh, but I think that I think we're seeing some echoes of that here. I'm skipping just a bit. Favorable towards Neoplatonism himself, Richard Tarnas summarizes, quote, all things are in constant flux, that's Heraclitus, and yet are fundamentally related and ordered through the universal logos, which is also manifest in the human being's power of reason. On the other side, Thomistic philosopher Norman Geisler, uh, who's not a Neoplatonist, uh, he locates the root and inspiration for Alfred North Whitehead's pan-entheistic process theology, first in Heraclitus and second in Plato. Okay, let's go ahead and skip to the conclusion, which will be on... You'll have to just read the other pages or so. So the conclusion on page 15. But yeah, as you can see, I've been just developing the problem, not so much the solution. So the solution will be in the next few pages. The conclusion will just be the spoiler. All right, there are several significant similarities between the Greek Logoi and John's Logos. Capitalizing on this compatibility, several of the early Greek church thinkers created bridges from the Greek Logoi to John's Logos to make Christianity more intelligible and acceptable to the Greco-Roman mind. Despite that overlap, our tour of the evolution of the pagan Greek conceptions of Logos ultimately show that the differences between the Greek concepts of Logos and John's Logos far outweigh the similarities. The Greek concepts shed little light, if any, on John's Logos, and there was little or no actual mimetic inheritance from the pagan Greek thinkers to John. That's my own judgment. Other people will disagree. Uh, John's Logos instead seems to be more predicated upon the Hebrew Mimra tradition, which we didn't get to talk about, uh, which would have been quite natural for John. You know, John being a Palestinian Jew, writing in a very basic style of Koine Greek. That's what he would do. He would use the, uh, the, the Hebrew building blocks, just the Koine Greek word. But John's Logos also transcends that tradition and becomes even richer and more profound term with John. Now, how do we interpret it? The best way to understand John's Logos is, of course, to just let John speak for himself. The scholars who examine John's Gospel and his epistles, using careful exegesis, you know, drawing meaning out of the text, you know, listening to it rather than pumping their own meaning into it, those are the voices to listen to. It's beyond the scope of this paper for us to do that here. I'd love to do it. But um, for now, let's just defer to, uh, to Leon Morris, the Johannine scholar that I mentioned earlier. I think it'd just be difficult to improve on his wording. All right, this is a big, big, lengthy, meaty quote, which, uh, which I love. When John used the term logos, then, he used a term that would be widely recognized among the Greeks. The average man would not know its precise significance to the philosophers, but he would know that it meant something very important. John could scarcely have used the Greek term without arousing in the minds of those who used the Greek language thoughts of something supremely great in the universe. But, though he would not have been unmindful of the associations aroused by the term, his essential thought does not derive from the Greek background. His gospel shows little trace of acquaintance with Greek philosophy and less dependence upon it. 
And the really important thing is that John is, in his use of logos, cutting across one of the fundamental Greek ideas. The Greeks thought of the gods as detached from the world, as regarding its struggles and its heartaches, its joys, its fears, with, ser with a serene, divine lack of feeling. They don't care about you. They don't care about your world. Now, John's idea of the logos conveys exactly the opposite idea. John's logos does not show us a God who is serenely detached, but a God who is passionately involved. Excuse me. <laughs> the logos speaks of God coming where we are, taking our nature upon himself, entering into the world's struggle, and out of this agony, winning men's salvation. More important for our understanding of this gospel in general, and its... Uh, and of its use of this term in particular, is the Jewish background. Skipping a bit. The Logos, alike for Jew and Gentile, represents the ruling fact of the universe. The Jew will remember from the Old Testament that, quote, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, end quote. The Greek will think of the rational principle of which all natural laws are particular expressions. Both will agree that this Logos is the starting point of all things. John was using the term which, with various shades of meaning, was in common use everywhere. He could reckon on all men catching its essential meaning. This, then, is the background of John's thought. But it's not the thought itself. He had a richer, deeper, fuller idea than any of his predecessors. For him, the word was not a principle, but a living being and the source of life. Not a personification, but a person. And that person, divine, the word was nothing less than God. Boom. <laughs> All right, now looking at it from a more philosophical standpoint, Christian philosopher and theologian Geiser has a similar judgment. He says, some scholars have assumed that John's gospel borrowed from the Greek usage of logos and hence did not teach the full deity of Christ. There is no reason, however, to suppose John is depicting something inferior <clears throat> to God and the Logos, John declares clearly and emphatically that the Logos was God. Uh, the, the Greek grammar is very, very clear on that. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, with their New World Translation, they will, that, it's not a translation. They just butcher it. They don't, it's not a, it's not a translation. Um, in fact, that's actually why I started studying Greek, was this uh, this problem of John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, John's concept of the Logos is of a personal being, Christ, whereas the Greeks thought of it as an impersonal, rational principle. The Logos is referred to by personal pronouns, such as he and his, and this was not true of the Greek Logos. According to John, the Logos became flesh. Now, to combine Logos, or reason, and nous, or mind, which is a, you know, what Plotinus and the Neoplatonists uh, like to use, to, to, to combine logos and noose and the flesh, you know, the material stuff of the world, especially the, the, the human's body. Uh, now, that was contrary to Greek thought. Flesh was either evil, just plain evil, as it was in Gnosticism, or it was nearly evil, as in Platonic or Plotinian, Neoplatonic thought. Only in the Judeo Christian tradition was matter of flesh, thought respectable in any sense. Christians saw it so good as to be worthy of clothing God in the incarnation. The Old Testament, not Greek ideas, is the root of New Testament ideas. John, as all the New Testament writers, except for perhaps possibly Luke, were Jews. I would add Palestinian Jews as opposed to Hellenistic Jews. Like in, like in Alexandria, Egypt, they would have been more Hellenistic. Uh, the root of their thought was in Judaism. They cite the Old Testament hundreds of times. Hence, it is contrary to Jewish background and thought of the New Testament writers to use Greek sources for their theological ideas. The New Testament is a theistic book, whereas Greek thought was polytheistic and pantheistic. So reinterpreting John's Gospel along emanational pantheistic or process panentheistic or neoplatonic lines is unwarranted. Examined rigorously, John 
Chapter 1 offers an apologetic for classical theism and orthodox Trinitarianism. Now, read in a shallow way and reinterpreted, it offers an entry point for Neoplatonists to begin to control the narrative and paint a different picture of God than Jesus, uh, sorry, than John really does. This danger was described by Norman Geiser as, quote, a serious challenge to traditional theism, and also the, quote, greatest challenge to evangelical classical theology. Yeah, no kidding. That's what he wrote. Uh, because in its denial of God as infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, the whole of evangelical theology collapses. That's appropriate. Yeah. Thank you for attending. Any comments, questions? If I don't know the answer, I'll make something up. Well, to, to bar in the, the noun form. Yes. It has never struck me as being equivalent or even similar to the Lobos presentation of John 1. Mm -hmm. it, it is very, I mean, it's the word of God. It's right. distinct from God. It is an emanation from God in that right. sense. So, so going back to the Hebrew yeah. source, I'm not sure proves, gives an adequate explanation mm -hmm. for what John's doing. Well, also keep in mind, uh, so John 1.1, 1, 1, or, or the beginning of John, is a creation account. And of course, Genesis 1 is a creation account. And Genesis 1 starts with God doing what? He speaks the world into existence. Uh, and, and so that's obviously his word, you know, being, you know, the Hebrew uh, language and, and thought process is very picturesque. So I don't want to get overly literal about it, but you know, how did God create it? Like a pantheist would say, or a panentheist might say that God created the universe out of his or her own body, you know. Um, but the theist will say, no, God created the universe out of nothing. How do you do that? I don't know. That's beyond my pay grade. But, uh, you know, the, the biblical testimony is he spoke it into existence, looks at it, says... But I think you're making good. my point, right? There's yeah. The use of spoke there it is nothing like the Jesus logos. Yes, he's using similar language. Yeah. But if you yeah. turn to map it towards done in the Hebrew, right? Right. I'm not, I'm not yeah, I, I guess I would say, and I think I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, so the Debar Memra tradition. Strong it, usage. It, 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 you know, it, it, this is the bar that John sets this high. You know, uh, Debar and Memra, they, they get, you know, they're starting to get there, but they don't go all the way. And then, like, maybe a Greek concept at best would be kind of down here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I think, I think what uh, Leon Morris would say, and probably Geiser as well, and I'll, I'll want myself in there, too, that, um, that uh, yeah, so John, John is predicating his idea off of the Memra tradition, but... Who knows how much thought he really put into it? It may just be sort of a foundation that he uses or that the Holy Spirit sure. uses no, to say, right. we're going to take right. that and we're going to amplify it to the nth degree, you know, just exponentially more magnificent and rich. So, so right, there, there is, I, I think, I would say there is a gulf between the Hebrew tradition and where John goes. And where John is like, whoo, yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense to me from, from based on my research. Yeah.